you go, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question. Um, if I order movies in my room, is it going to be itemized? Like, you know, will it, you know, show the name of the movie or anything like that? Yes, it will actually. It will. Is okay. An issue? No, no, no. I'm just curious, you know. Anyway, all right, cool. Ready? Go. Yeah. Have a good day, guys. Thanks. Speaking of trying it out, are you actually going to skinny dip out there? Why not? I did it in Denison. Haven't you seen the movie Jaws? Actually, a piranha would probably scare me a little bit more, but I think we're all right. Hey, I'll see you at dinner. Dinner. See you. And I'll, I'll Wear something nice. I'm, well, swimsuit. All right. So while we were in Fredericksburg, Texas, we decided, hey, why not meet up with our good friend, Dr. Jody Edward Gint, historian, veteran, and the executive director of the Texas Rangers Heritage Center in Fredericksburg. I don't know about y'all, but I'm hungry. Let's go. Let's yeah. get it. Let's get some food. Come on. Thanks, sir. Sure. Welcome to Austin, as y'all. Yes, sir. Alright, you got it. Oh, man. You see the coming? Yeah. bill coming? Bill coming? Yeah, Sprock is your name. Sprock is your Or you can say Special. Special. The friends of your own north are Nine! Yeah. Well, welcome to the Auslander. Hey, man. How's it going? <laughs> Good, good, how are you? All right, now you're the owner. Right? Yes, I'm the owner. My name's Sam, I'm the owner of the Auslander, and pleasure to have you guys here. We've been around here for over 30 years. How so long? 30 over, years? Over 30 years, and wow. uh, we're gonna have Jenny be your server today and take care of you. Fantastic, we're really looking forward to what you guys have to offer. Excellent. Right. Well, good, thanks. Thank you so much, we'll enjoy. What are you gonna bring him? Um, <laughs> Pepsi that and Dr. Pepper. I want, I want this one. Oh, you pick fights! I'm picking this one. Prost. Guten Tag. I don't know. Prost. <laughs> Man. That is good. I've needed that. That hit the spot. I've I put hair that. on my chest. Let me tell you. Oh, wow. <laughs> If you've been to Fredericksburg, but you've never been to the Auslander, well, you're missing out. This place is a staple in downtown Fredericksburg. The place is fun, it's authentic, the food is delicious, the beers are absolutely amazing, even more so in these massive glasses. So make sure that the next time you come to Fredericksburg, you stop on by. So we are here at, well, Fredericksburg, Texas, and it's home of the National Museum of the Pacific War. This is Chester Nimitz, an incredible statue of Chester Nimitz. He died a long time ago, so it's not really him. It's just a statue. Don't be weirded out. So we're gonna go into the museum. Are you ready to? Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to this. It should be good stuff. This should be good. I've been wanting to come here for a very long time. Yep. Very long. This is the Admiral Nimitz Gallery, which is just a small part of the National Museum of the Pacific War. When Alan and I walked into the Admiral Nimitz Gallery at the National Museum of the Pacific War, we were blown away by the immense detail and care shown in creating the extensive display. 
The Admiral Nimitz Gallery guides you through the personal history of one of America's, if not one of history's, greatest military heroes. You soon realize how big a part the town of Fredericksburg played in Nimitz's life as well as his German upbringing. The gallery is full of images, infographics, artifacts, and stories that help tell the tale of arguably our country's greatest admiral. There is so much information just in the gallery that it will take several hours to truly go through it all. It is made very obvious how appreciative the city of Fredericksburg, the Texas Historical Commission, and the Admiral Nimitz Foundation is for the hometown hero. But not just a hometown hero, a global hero. A man who played a massive role in bringing an end to the expansive and destructive power of Imperial Japan during World War II. This really shows the character of Admiral Nimitz. After the Japanese surrendered on September 2nd, 1945, Admiral Nimitz went ashore and he visited with wounded Japanese servicemen at a hospital. He then went to go visit Togo, Admiral Togo's flagship, the Mikasa. Now he was a big admirer of Admiral Togo. He noticed that you know the ship wasn't in the best of shape. So what he did was he put Marines there to guard the ship to make sure that none of the U.S. servicemen would you know, do anything to it, damage it, steal souvenirs. And then he used his own money to restore that ship. He encouraged the Japanese, you know, let's restore the ship. The Japanese who already admired Admiral Nimitz were like, you know what, we're gonna, we want to return the favor. So there's a garden outside, it's called the Japanese Garden of Peace. That garden was a gift from the Japanese people to the American people to show the friendship between the two nations. And we've been at peace with Japan ever since. You know that there were only four five-star admirals in uh, the U.S. Navy? Mm -hmm. Name them. Okay. There was Admiral King, Leahy, Leahy Halsey, Halsey, and Nimitz. And, Nimitz. and he was the uh, last survivor. So if you want to learn a ton about Chester W. Nimitz, you got to come to the Nimitz Gallery at the National Museum of the Pacific War. And we're about to talk to somebody who knows a whole lot about Chester Nimitz, General Hagee. Now, General Hagee was a four-star general, and he was the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Now, the Marines are part of the Department of the Navy, so they don't have five-star generals. Four, four stars is as high as it gets. General Hagee attained that level, so we are about to meet him. Yeah, it's a huge honor to even get to talk to him, and so we know that you're gonna enjoy this interview. General Michael Hagee was gracious enough to spend an extended amount of time with us discussing his thoughts on Admiral Nimitz. What you will see is just a portion of the interview. You can find the full interview on our YouTube channel. In my opinion, Admiral Nimitz was a unique individual. We were very lucky to have him. He, being raised here, very poor, he learned some really hard lessons. His grandfather told him, in order to be successful, you have to do three things in life. You have to learn everything that you can. Number two, regardless of what situation you're put in, you need to perform the best that you can. And number three, don't worry about things you cannot change. Nimitz followed those three principles all the days of his life. Very, not everyone knows he was, as a young ensign, he was general court-martial for running a ship aground. And he tried, like everything, to get that ship off of the, uh, off of the mud there and the, off the Philippines. Could not do it. It was a hot night, nothing he could do. 
He went down, he got a cot, brought it up on the deck, and went to sleep. Don't worry about things you cannot change. He pled guilty at the general court-martial, accepted uh, the punishment that he received, and just kept going. Uh, don't worry about the things you cannot change. That stood him in good stead, and he also shared that with the individuals with uh, whom he served. When Nimitz was a young officer, to be a real sailor, you needed to be a battleship sailor. Where was Nimitz assigned? These funny things that looked like cigars, and they went down and up in the water. Oh, a submarine. Uh, the Navy knew nothing about submarines. When he got on board that submarine, he learned everything he could about it. He wanted to go to sea on a battleship. Where was he sent one time? To Germany. He spoke German to learn engineering. They'd come up with a diesel engine. He learned everything about that. He brought that back to the, uh, to the, United, States, uh, to the United States Navy, following what his grandfather had told him about, don't worry about where you are, learn everything that, uh, everything that you can. He did that through his life. He established the NROTC program that we have today when he was assigned as an instructor out at Berkeley, California. Everywhere he went, he said, okay, I got it. I may not like being here, but I'm going to do it. One last story. Uh, when Kimmel was, before Kimmel was assigned to uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, Roosevelt wanted Nimitz to go. Nimitz said, no. He told the President of the United States, I will not go. And the President said, why? He says, because I am too junior, and it would hurt the Navy if I was assigned out there. And so they assigned Kimmel out there. And one may, uh, one may ask, uh, what did Nimitz think of uh, Kimmel after uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December and when Kimmel was relieved. Uh, Nimitz answered that question very simply. If I would have gone, I would have been relieved too. His impact on what happened in the Pacific was absolutely critical. Uh, and it was especially important in the Battle of Midway. Very few people know that in January of 1942, he'd been there less than a month, uh, first off, the Navy did not want him to have that assignment uh, in, a, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, but Roosevelt said, he's my man, he's going. In January of 42, uh, Secretary of War asked the uh, CNO, I want your top 40 admirals, because this is going to be a long war, and I want to know which guys um, I need to look at. Guess who was not on that list? Admiral Nimitz was not one of the top 40 admirals in the Navy, and he was in charge of the entire Pacific. Nimitz knew that. Can you imagine the amount of pressure he was under right after Pearl Harbor? He came in, the entire, Kimmel had been relieved, the entire staff said, we're gone. He's going to fire us all. Nimitz came up to the, uh, to the briefing room to meet the staff, and he said, you are my guys. We're going to win this together. And then, you know, the story about the, how they determined it, uh, the Japanese were going to Midway, Washington disagreed with that. They didn't think they were going to Midway. Nimitz backed his individuals and did, and did not defer to Washington, even though he understood that they did not trust him back there. Uh, so he was absolutely pivotal. Two things on Midway. Uh, the Japanese had, if you look at the correlation of forces, uh, Japan should have won. They had much more equipment out there. Uh, Nimitz knew this, and so he told his admirals, we're at a disadvantage here, but if you see an opportunity to take out their carriers, go all in. Whoa! <laughs> That's pretty big at that time when you're not sure. I mean, today we believe that, well, of course we're going to win the war. 
at that point in time, no, they did not believe necessarily they're going to win the war. Point one. Point two, everyone has seen the film of him out there pitching horseshoes, uh, and they knew a battle was coming, and he was out there pitching horseshoes. You know what he was doing? He knew that the mood back in the United States was such that they were afraid that we were going to lose. They knew that a battle was coming. They didn't know exactly where or how. And here is the commander out there with his sailors pitching horseshoes. A great public affairs thing. He didn't ever actually say that, but that's what his intent was to reassure the people back in the United States. So he had both the, the battlefield experience to fight and know how to fight, and he also knew that he needed to speak to the American people. We had the right individual out there. Said that already. I'm starving. Uh, yeah, and well, I've heard all right. good things about this place. I heard the carne asada here is really good. So after our time in the Admiral Nimitz Gallery and our interview with General Michael Hagee, Alan and I were pretty hungry. So we headed right across the street over to Tubby's Ice House. Now this place is more than just an ice house. This place has really, really good food. Mr. Tubbs. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome, you idiot. <laughs> a little bit about our food in the sense that we have our full pork loaded fries that are very popular. Mm -hmm. We cut our fries in house. Our tubby sauce is to die for. All the sauces are made in house, as well as like pickling the cabbage, making our red cabbage slaw. Everything is made in house, fresh, nothing frozen, and also it's also made with love. You can't be bad. There you go, you can't beat it. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have the love. You gotta have fresh the love. love. Do you fresh like love? love? It depends where the love's coming from. <laughs> there you there go. You go. Well, yeah. It's coming from uh, the kitchen? Yes. Oh, then that, yes. After a really good meal at Tubby's, Alan and I headed back across the street for our tour of the National Museum of the Pacific War. This World War II museum is a state-of-the-art exhibit. There's so much to see, including real World War II planes, howitzers, and even a submarine. If you want to discover how Japan became an imperial power and how America defeated the land of the rising sun, you have to come to Fredericksburg's Pacific War Museum. So this first section of the museum is incredible because it summarizes exactly how Japan got to the point of where they were at the beginning of World War II. And a lot of it has to do with the age of colonialism. Now, the Japanese were isolationists up until the time Commodore Perry showed up in the 1850s. So, but they, they embraced the, you know, the European way uh, in terms of technology and they modernized and they decided they wanted to be a colonial power themselves. Yeah, they so, took off with Korea. Mm -hmm. They got Korea, they had the Sino-Japanese Wars, the Russo-Japanese Wars, and all of this comes together in World War I as well and it is all in this section and it does a fantastic job of letting you know that Japan just wasn't where they were mm -hmm. at the beginning of World War II. So let's go check out the rest. I really like the way this museum just illustrates the steps leading to War with Japan. All right. Whoa. Oh, wow. Is that what I think it is? I think so. Please, please. So we're in the Pearl Harbor section of the museum. 
Everybody knows Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, in front of this submarine. Explain exactly what this is. Okay, this is a Japanese two-man midget submarine. During the attack, the Japanese sent five of these to also participate. Um, none of the five made it back home. Uh, this one right here was one of the ones that had the lone survivor. There was one survivor out of the ten, yeah. and th this was his sub. Yeah, and so you did say midget. I just want to let you know that. I'm, I'm and, done. That's so, so what they called it. It was a midget sub. They didn't call it a little man sub. Oh, God. We're going there. All right, so we are in front of the B-25 Mitchell. These are the bombers that were sent as the initial response to the Pearl Harbor attack. This is 16 bombers that were sent via carrier. The, the uh, Hornet. And, yeah, the Hornet, Hornet. And bombed Tokyo. This was, you know, that initial was, response yeah, that was, was needed. The first time Japan had ever been bombed. But before that even happened, Douglas MacArthur was able to escape from the Philippines, and Admiral Husband Kimmel, now he was the commander-in-chief of the Pacific during Pearl Harbor. He was relieved of command, and Chester Nimitz now became the new commander of the Pacific Fleet. And when Nimitz and uh, MacArthur met, they were told that they were going to share command. MacArthur would get the southwest part of the Pacific, Nimitz would get the rest. Yeah. So, a lot of speaking that information of is over Nimitz' here. command, Coral Sea, Midway, these are big battles. So let's go check that out. This museum also shows so much about two of the big battles that took place after the Doolittle Raid. You had the Battle of the Coral Sea, the Battle of Midway. Coral Sea, the first one that we stopped the Japanese, and in the Midway was the one where we annihilated the Japanese fleet. Mm -hmm. We lost some good carriers, a lot of good men, the Yorktown, the Lexington during those two battles, but that was the turning point, and that's when we began the offensive against the Japanese Empire. Incredible, incredible. And I know what you're thinking. Are we at the Midway point? Yes and no. Let's keep going. Okay. Like somebody's watching us. Oh, hey. Oh, there we go. Oh, I thought maybe you were doing security. Oh, maybe. Well, okay, now we were now in the next phase of the campaign. This museum has a uh, Wildcat uh, fighter. Now, this was the, the great fighter. It wasn't the best. It was replaced eventually by the Hellcat. Mm -hmm. But this is what we used to fight the Japanese in the beginning of the war. Now, we were now at a new phase. August 7, 1942, we land on Guadalcanal. We're now on the offensive. Japanese want to take us back, take it back. Now, during this time, there were a lot of naval engagements. We ended up losing the WASP, the aircraft carrier WASP. We lost the Hornet. Saratoga was damaged. All we had left was the Enterprise. The Enterprise was the only U.S. carrier to defend the entire Pacific against the Japanese. Right. So, but it was a slow campaign, a lot of battles. And the highlight of the Solomon's campaign, which was the String of Islands, mm -hmm. was when we attacked and killed Admiral Yamamoto. Yep. He was the Nimitz, he was Japan's version of Nimitz. And uh, he was killed in a raid on the one year anniversary of the Doolittle Raids. Yep. So that, after the Solomon's campaign, we then went to the next phase of the Pacific War. Happy anniversary. You know, this uh, tank was destroyed by the gun that's down there, but you have to come to the museum to actually see it. Wow. Actual tank and gun. Okay, now, we are at a fork in the road. Absolutely. This is MacArthur. This is Nimitz. New Guinea side with MacArthur leads to capturing New Guinea and going to the Philippines, which led to the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the greatest naval battle in the history of warfare. This one, on the other hand, is Nimitz. Now, Nimitz was in charge of capturing the, or doing the island hopping campaign, the Solomons, the Marshall, Gilbert, Carolinas. It went to the Marianas. When we captured the Mariana Islands, we were able to start bombing Japan. After the Marianas and the Philippines, that led to Iwo Jima and Okinawa, and that consolidated our hold in the Pacific. So, and Speaking of the island hopping, how about we hop on over to uh, Japan and the bomb? Not 
of an actor. There's a sign that says don't touch. Oh, okay. All right. Now, we are very fortunate to be here at this museum because that's not a replica. That is an actual casing of the Fat Man, yeah. the plutonium bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. Now, three days before Nagasaki, Hiroshima was bombed by the little boy, which was a uranium bomb. This museum actually has, this is not a replica, it's an actual casing of it, and they have it here. And you can't touch it. Yeah, you can't touch it, so yeah. worth coming here. I mean, yeah, I mean, these things, okay, so they killed about 200,000, but. So they killed about yeah. 200,000. But, you know, had we invaded Japan, there would have been at least a million Allied casualties, and the Japanese, their estimates, somewhere between 10, 50, million in the millions, 10 to 50 million people would have died. It's really wild seeing these up close. Um, and luckily it's not active because I would hate to see it up close, active. Yes, so. Speaking yeah. of, let's get active and head on out. Let's do that. Wow, so Japan surrenders and the Second World War comes to an end. That's right. And so does this tour. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to come to the Pacific War Museum here in Fredericksburg. You're absolutely going to love it. I know I did. You know, it's, it's the same as uh, what I saw at the Smithsonian, uh, the World War I Museum in Kansas City. It's just as fascinating. I cannot, cannot recommend this place. I don't want to hear nothing about no Kansas City. So we exit the National Museum of the Pacific War, but we still have one more place to go. The Japanese Garden of Peace. This serene Japanese garden is a beautiful and tranquil spot located on the grounds of the Pacific War Museum. This garden was presented by the Japanese government to the American government as a symbol of peace and friendship between the two nations. So when you visit the museum, you have to visit the Japanese Garden of Peace. So this is the Japanese Garden of Peace. It symbolizes the long-standing relationship, the friendship now between Japan and America. And in fact, in the back there is a replica of Admiral Togo's study. And actually, Admiral Togo was a huge influence on Admiral Nimitz. Yes, uh, Admiral Togo uh, was a victor in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Japanese consider Nimitz, Togo, and Lord Nelson of Britain as the three greatest admirals that ever lived. That's pretty cool. So, this is the end of the Pacific War Museum in Fredericksburg, Texas. And man, what a tour, what a sight. Hope you come out here and you'll have a great time. Let's get out of here. All right, so this place is a staple in Fredericksburg. This is Hondo's. And if you have ever heard of like the, you know, let's go to Lukenbach, Texas, that song, or anything about Lukenbach, Texas, it started really with Hondo. I'm not gonna get all into it, but uh, what I do wanna get into is some food and some drink. I heard their margaritas are what they're known for. So, yeah. uh, dude, I'm ready for a margarita. I need one, let's yes. go. All right, yeah. let's do it.
Fredericksburg, Texas is known for a lot of things. Their main street has so many places to shop, it'll take you all week to get through all of them. They've also got renowned wineries, distilleries, breweries, and fantastic restaurants. And of course, the very reason we're here, Chester W. Nimitz and the National Museum of the Pacific War. But whatever it is that you're gonna do when you're here, you better grab a good breakfast. And we couldn't have found a better place than the Werner Warehouse. Good to see you. Good yeah. to see you. I'm Alan. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Aren't you with the Fredericksburg Convention and Visitors Bureau? You got it. All right, see? <laughs> Fantastic. I knew I saw her from somewhere. We love this town. What makes this town so great? Yeah, well, Fredericksburg is really great for a lot of reasons. It's got everything you want, you know, in a small town, but with big city accommodations. So you've got culture, history, you've got amazing food, and of course, a fabulous Texas wine scene, and great shopping. What more could you want? I don't think we want any more. It feels like I'm walking in a Hallmark movie when I come down here. And uh, yeah, especially walking is, with you, man. Well, you know, we're not holding hands or anything. <laughs> but, you know, I'll say this this is a pretty nice place to, like, bring, you know, real yes. people. Unlike me. You know. <laughs> so what are, some, what are some cool things to do here um, that people, when, when they come here, definitely come here? And even, like, some seasonal stuff. Yeah, so of course you've got to go shopping along Main Street. 150 shops, boutiques, art galleries with wineries, well, vineyard, tasting rooms, mm -hmm. mixed in, distilleries, great restaurants, farm to table scene, and amazing history. About 700 different historical stops along the downtown area that you just can't miss. Um, this is actually our 175th birthday, um, wow. so great time to come and celebrate all year long. And then throughout the year, we have tons of events going on, pretty much a festival every weekend, so you'll never be bored. Awesome. Now, we went to the museum, the Pacific War Museum. We're going to the Pioneer Museum, and I've heard that that's like Texas German stuff. Like, what's the Pioneer Museum about? It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's amazing. So if you want to learn about how Fredericksburg became this little German Texas town that it is, that's where you go. They have amazing curators and historians that have just done a fabulous job of telling the Fredericksburg story. All right, well, we're looking forward to going. You ready? Yeah, I am ready. All that's right, good. Amanda, it was nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Take care. Enjoy. Nice to meet you. All right, any other jokes you want to say before we go? I'm pleased to meet you. Please. <laughs> Hello, I'm Evelyn Weinheimer, a native of Fredericksburg, Texas. I am the archivist here at Pioneer Museum in Fredericksburg, which is a holding of the Gillespie County Historical Society. On the grounds here, three and a half acres, we have buildings that tell the story of our ancestors, and I say our ancestors. I have traced all of my family lineage to the groups that came in 1846 up to about 1857. Visitors to Fredericksburg can visit the Pioneer Museum uh, with buildings like this Weber Sunday House. Uh, we also have a volunteer fire department museum. Then as we continue around the three and a half acres, there's a log cabin. Um, then the one room schoolhouse, um, White Oak School used that one. We want our visitors to experience some of the same experiences that our ancestors shared with one another when they first came to Fredericksburg. And we feel like we have the artifacts and the wagons, uh, the farm tools, the kitchen utensils that will tell that story to our visitors. You may say, good, danke, es geht mir gut. Nein, 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 nein. English. Ah, English. Uh, uh, thanks. 
I am good und dir. Under. Under. Uh, dirt. Dirt? No. Und dir. Und dir? Oh dear? No. And you? And no you. No you. Ich bin sehr glücklich. Mach's gut, meine gute Kinder. Danke schön. Nee, wave, 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 now, whether you speak German or not, when you come to Fredericksburg, make sure you visit the Pioneer Museum. So after our visit, we stopped by one of the coolest restaurants in Fredericksburg, Hill and Vine. The food, the drinks, the atmosphere, the friendly service, they've got it all at this restaurant. You come to Fredericksburg to make memories. And I can guarantee you that this restaurant experience is one you won't forget. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right, so that was Jesse Barter. He's the owner of Hill and Vine. Dude, yeah. the food was great. I mean, and uh, David, the server, did a good job. Stellar. Yeah. yeah, and the atmosphere, phenomenal. If you've never been to Hill and Vine when you've come to Fredericksburg, you're missing out. And speaking of, Fredericksburg, it's known for the wine country. Mm -hmm. Wine sounds about good. I think so. Guten? Uh, sehr gut. Ja, sehr gut. Ja, sehr, sehr gut. gut. Yeah. All right. Guten Tag. No, no, no. Guten Tag. No, forget it. You ruined it. You know, this place here, yep. not only do they sell great wine, but this is also the birthplace of Chester Nimitz back in February of 1885. Okay. All right. Are you, are you sick or something? What? Are you trying to call Chester Nimitz a drunk or something? Look, he. No. You think he would have been able to do his job while sipping wine and stuff, rescuing the the rest of the world from tyranny? Dude, see, it's people like you that make me sick. It's people like you that make me look like a really good person, and I'm you a know, terrible person. I've had it up to you here know who's a great person? Chester Nimitz. You. You know sick what? Man. Okay, I'm gonna. I, I can't. No, I'm gonna have to have a drink. I can't. Listen. A little argument, you know, still. Okay. You know, I'm losing my temperance with you. Sounds like you guys need some wine. Uh, yeah. Sure, we're yeah? up, because the uh, 21st Amendment called for this guy, so I think we're. Uh, very funny, okay. very funny. Right. You definitely need some wine. Okay, come this way. So, here at Perspective, we are known for our wine flights. We have over 50 wines offered by the glass and by the bottle and we really focus on an educational experience when you're tasting these wines. Teach you something about wines maybe you've never had before. Okay, so now you mentioned that two of these are from your vineyards in California, but you also mentioned a Spaniard and a Argentinian. So I'm assuming yeah. you're not exclusive, you don't exclusively sell your own wines, you do that's sell right. other wines. Yeah, that's, that's right. We have um, our family vineyard that we feature here exclusively at Perspective, Topping Nignon, but we also have wines from all over the world. Um, Argentina, Spain, France, I mean Austria, you can taste wines from the Alps, you can taste wines from literally anywhere. Um, and that's great to compare, actually. Um, a lot of people want to do a Texas tasting, and we have a, a taste of Texas flight. And that's a really great to, um, to kind of, you know, taste a little taste of the local wines, too, which is very important here in Fredericksburg. It's, now, it's number two, actually, to Napa, as far as wine country. So, um, so the wine scene here is huge. People come to Fredericksburg uh, expecting to taste wine all day <laughs> um, and night sometimes. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, really special for them to kind of sometimes break away from just the Texas wineries and have an international experience as well. So how cool is it that where you do business is where Nimitz was born? And how do people react whenever they find out that he was born here? 
they they go crazy. Um, I'd say half and half of them know what's going on, and they read the plaque outside. They're excited to come in. Um, you know, they're touching the stone. They're getting they're getting into it. Um, but then the other half, you know, they're unaware, and those are my favorite because they come in, they're doing their wines, and they just find out that you know they're actually sitting in the birthing room, and they find out, oh my God, Chester Nimitz was born literally where I'm sitting. So that's really special to see their reaction, and um, and they probably most of them had just been to the museum. So you know. It's something that we need to market a little bit more, especially with the museum, to say, hey, you know, if you go to the museum, you get your ticket to come over and see the birthplace, too. Now, this is all original. The floors, the That's stones, right. everything. Uh, this is all original. Everything's original. Nothing's been tainted or touched, painted. Um, the original stone. We're now sitting in the um, outside of the house, actually. You can see this window here. That was the, that was the birthing room. Um, they would look out to, to the well and to their, their barn, um, but this was their outside dining room. So this is, this is their outside fire pit. This is the original where they would cook their meats. And yeah, it's, it's great that it's obviously built very well and still stands. Well, I want to say Prost, uh, Guten Tag, uh, Danke schön, and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. We, we thank you so it. much for coming in. I hope thank you guys you. make it back to perspective. Thank you. Oh, Absolutely. Well, this is great. This is great. Yeah. I'm curious about the basement. Did Ira Einhorn ever live here by any chance? Yeah. Just, uh, no. Einhorn? Have a look. Ira, Finkel and Einhorn? Ira Einhorn. Ira Einhorn. Einhorn is Finkel. No, not Einhorn. Einhorn is a man. No, I'm talking about the, the movement dude. The Ira Einhorn. Whatever is it? The guy, the Earth First guy, whatever is it? Earth First. Remember he buried his girlfriend? Oh, yeah. We talked about that on the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, man? You know what we need? We need a watch, John. Wine with some beer. What? Are you drunk? No. No, I'm good. Okay, you're right. Alright. Uh, wine before beer, never fear. Alright, we're good. Must be ready for some beer. Uh, yes, sir. Of course. Work. How are you doing, yeah, man? Good. Good to see you. Go. This is great or what? This is the best. Are you okay? Dude, I'm like day off from work, so yes. Rick, good to see you, man. Alan. See you all, Alan. Nice to meet you. All right. Sit down and have a beer. Can't right. wait. All right, Rick. Rick Green, you're the brewmaster here at yeah. Fredericksburg Brewing Company. What do we got? we got? What do we got? We got a sampler of the beers we have on tap right now. And you know, light to dark, a little everything in between. We ought to probably start off with the light, okay. lightest one here. Which is? Don't get that one. Don't get, get that this one. one. Down. Get the Hellas. This is the Munich Hellas. Hellas okay. is that yeah. Greek or something? It is not Greek, <laughs> but that's close. Okay. That's a light German lager. That is delicious. That is hellish good. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. I like Y'all like German beer? Yes. You're in the right spot. Who could not like German beer? <laughs> exactly. Maybe the French, but you know. Too soon. <laughs> is it too, too soon? Too soon. Red ale? Yeah. Irish oh, red? Aye. 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 Irish. I enjoy that drink there, uh, boy. Irish, Scottish, okay. whatever's on the border. <laughs> Let's go down to the porter right now. This is my personal favorite. Pioneer Porter. Pioneer Porter. World Porter. famous. To the pioneers. Yeah. To the pioneers. We call this place the Porter House. Oh, I don't like boy. your stupid jokes. You know, <laughs> Here everyone we else. Go. Here we go. Laughing. You want to do this? He no, he's laughing because jokes. I reacted oh, yeah. and I got angry. That's good. Y'all aren't even drinking the right beers. Put them back down. I'm gonna drink them. <laughs> Peace Pipe Pale Ale, named in honor of the peace treaty that the Germans and Comanches signed. And oh, yeah. so it's, it's also, a, it's a hoppy American pale. It's uh, called the... Gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and I use the term loosely. <laughs> you got oh, the one red more ale. left, right? Yeah, we have another oh, this one. Oh, the Enchanted Rock Red Ale. Hello. Uh, Amp Cellar. Ambrosia. Yeah. They won't let us on Enchanted Rock because the Texas Parks and Wildlife it requires us to have a million dollar Insurance policy, come on. And a mask. <laughs> Man, you know? Wow. That one's. I love you guys. That was very smooth. <laughs> you guys are just. <laughs> you're my best friend. <laughs> you guys in the whole are world. the best. You know? Love this guy. Uh huh. Rick, we just met you. Rick, Kevin, doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't anymore, matter. Man. It don't matter. <laughs> 
that's hilarious. I think we should make him part of the crew. What do you say? Where are we going next? <laughs> to Decatur? We're going to go horseback riding next. Oh. Yeah. Let's go. Drinking let's and riding. Let's go. Drink. Yeah, let's bring all this. Loving you, Hey, right, brother, I'm going to tell you right now. I don't know wine, beer. I don't know if I'm good to drive. But if you can't drive, what do you say we ride horses? Horses. Yes. I love horses. Which way? Welcome to DF Ranch, guys. You got it, man. Thanks. I'm Alan. Nice to meet I'm you. I'm Guy. Guy. Nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you guys. We're ready to go. All right, well, let's saddle up. Yeah, let's do it. Need to get you guys to sign a release real quick, if For you what? don't mind. Uh, just in case things go wrong. Things like, usually? Like what could go yeah. wrong? Ah, uh, who knows? Oh, uh, well. All right, I mean, I've ridden horses before. I mean, how difficult is that? It's, I would uh, like to know what could go wrong. That it's Walmart, like riding a bicycle. Walmart, and they had one of those, uh, you know, for a quarter, I think you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you guys ready to saddle up and go? Oh yeah, there's just one thing left for us to do. Yeehaw. We call this Lighthouse Mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, this We call it a lighthouse. It was basically an aircraft beacon back in the late 1920s. Uh, they ran the program through the mid to late 30s and it was for the airplane, uh, the mail planes that carried mail. And this was on the route from uh, San Antonio to San, uh, San Angelo. And uh, they took them out of service in the 1930s uh, once the uh, the planes got instrumentation and they no longer had to fly by sight. Yeah. So now that's, uh, you know, that's about a hundred years ago, but this ranch has been in your family for much longer, right? Yeah. Since the 1850s, uh, they came over from Germany and it was part of the original German land grants. So it, it's kind of cool to have some history here and absolutely stay in the family. You've got Nimitz relative, uh, you know, there's a, relation with Nimitz with your family, right? Yeah. So my great grandmother and Nimitz were first cousins. Uh, their mothers were sisters. Wow. So oh, that's cool. our claim to fame. Yeah. Yeah. And this <laughs> massive ranch, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And your work with Magnificent Seven. Yeah. And you being in the film industry and you've got the GF ranch. That's it. So, yeah. Living the Just dream. Just a few things that are a claim to fame. <laughs> yeah. So your, fam your family has owned this land between the era of the, um, Texas Republic and the Civil War. Yeah. So yeah. that's, uh, wait a minute, look at this, this horse. <laughs> <laughs> so you're pulling back on him? Yeah. As long as you have tension, he's going to back up. Okay. I'm going to so. stay, I'm going to stay right here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to say that I really like this view. I would like to just build a home in a place. Like, I don't really care about no. what your future looks like. No, man. But I'll I mean, tell you this... what the future of this documentary looks like. This looks like a great ending. Yes, it does. To our... Friendship? Travels <laughs> and friendship. <laughs> yeah. Because the way you've been handling this horse is an embarrassment to the show and to America. My horse is... Has a mind of its own. That's why. Mm -hmm. Okay? I get... I date smart women. I ride smart horses. They have a mind of their own. That's true. That's right. So I'll tell you what, man. This is an incredible view. Yeah. And it's been an incredible... It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it has. I'd like to do more of these. <sighs> you thanks, know... Thanks to Chester Nimitz for bringing us out here. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, this would just be another town. But, you know, you look... This would be the perfect place to just settle down. I could settle down here. Literally. This is weird. Why? Why are you talking about settling down? Uh, dude, I'm in I'm my too, 50s. I'm too close to you for you to be talking like um, that. You know. You've totally screwed up this entire 
trip. I haven't screwed up anything. I'm just right, thinking I'm about here. my future. I'm, I'm thinking here. about. Nice man. You know. Let's go. Let's go. God. Please get me You know, out of here. Uh, all I gotta say is this. Away from this guy. Fredericksburg. Oh. <laughs> oh, God. All right, get me away from the horse. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We're not rushing you, idiot. <laughs> nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah. So, you, um... Uh... Now you can walk through the shot, idiots. Like, that's the whole idea. You idiot? Go, 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 go. go. No, 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 oh. no, no. Oh. The great outdoors. I think this would just be a fine, fine place to settle down and. Get... Hey! Come on, Poncho, let's follow that horse's ass.